All right, my name is Eric Alexander. I am executive director of the Brigham Education Institute. I know most of you, uh, but welcome to those who are new. And thank you for coming to this last of our uh, seven seminar series uh, surrounding the topic of medical education research and the basic skills and processes to uh, become better, uh, to move from novice to intermediate in that regard. So it's been a great run for the year. This is our last of our sessions, um, but the good news is if you missed any, we're gonna kind of reformat and redo this again next year. Uh, we continue to evolve the program. Uh, welcome to invite you back and any of your colleagues to those sessions as those uh, will be reformatted and restarted back in October. Uh, many of you have to leave early. Some of you will be arriving late, I know. Uh, and so we just generally keep going here. We totally understand um, and uh, appreciate your time here. So a couple things. We do record the session. Uh, certainly, uh, if you don't want to be recorded from your video standpoint, just turn off your uh, camera. The second issue is we monitor the chat box. So uh, thank you to Christina Dezara, who you see here. Uh, please feel free to participate in the chat uh, ongoing or bring up questions or topics as well. And we really have a fun session ahead. So uh, with that, I want to also introduce kind of the lead on this whole effort, uh, which is Dr. Shuba Ramani, who's um, together with the uh, efforts initially in the Department of Medicine, brought this together with us in the BEI. And I think it's been a wonderful success. Shuba, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Eric. Um, so before getting started, I want to add my welcome. And I just also want to show the continuity of the thread of this series. We started... I guess in October, uh, with activating an educational project with Ed's 12, uh, 10 tips, right? And now we are finishing up with writing up educational manuscripts. And today is going to be interactive. We're going to have uh, small group exercises so to actually work on writing. And just a few slides and let's run through this. So let me start with sharing my slides. So this is today's topic, as you know, and session goals, we keep things rather simple and so that we can get our hands around it. So we, are, I, we plan to introduce the problem gap hook, the model or heuristic for writing educational manuscripts or telling a scientific story. And we'll reflect on how we can elevate educational scholarship because what we want to do is advance the field. And note, I didn't say research alone. There are many forms of scholarship. And we'll actually discuss and apply strategies to draft, edit, submit, and respond to reviews. Very ambitious, but we'll get the nuts and bolts across. So as far as introduction of a manuscript, this is where everything begins. This is where we convince our readers, or even before the readers, the reviewers and the editors, that our story is worth telling. And one of the mistakes, and I will say, I'll spotlight all the mistakes I used to make, and I'm better, and I'm still learning. So we wax eloquent about the topic that we are so enthusiastic about and we wish to study. But the problem is, we talk about the topic, we don't frame it in terms of a problem statement. So what is the problem we are intending to study? And so making a topic versus problem, making it a problem statement. But then the next thing is we often talk about studying the problem within our own local environment. So why should anyone outside our local environment care? Who cares? So what? And that's a, the, those are two questions often asked. And then we run into the literature review and Susan will tell us, so what is the current knowledge about the topic? So briefly, we need to know, or we need to give a nod to scholars before us who have worked diligently and have advanced the field already on this topic. But we're not here to reproduce what they've already done, but we need to then quickly distill down, what are the gaps in the current understanding and is our study going to be positioned well in this conversation? So that is the purpose of the literature review, not to teach our readers all about this topic they ever wanted to know. So identifying, so what is this thing called gap? What have others said? And are there interesting questions yet to be studied? 
what have others said, said or indicated or resulted? And are there areas there that are only partially explained that need more of an explanation? Or what have others said? And is there still a debate? And we'd like to enter the debate and study one end or the other of the debate. And finally, the hook, which is how to convince editors, reviewers, and readers that we actually have filled some of the gap and partially explained things that have not yet been explained. And that hook is what leads us to our study questions. So there should be the hook before we say the purpose of our study or specific study questions, our study aims or study objectives are. And that's what I mean by problem, gap, and hook. All these sections need to be introduced in, within the introduction section. So with that, um, I'll just give you a quick glance at what a problem gap hook looks like in my last uh, paper that was published already. So the problem is newer conceptualization of feedback, describe it as a complex interpersonal interaction, yet, so the first part is a description of the topic, but the yet feedback in clinical education uh, mostly emphasize skills of giving feedback. So the yet turns that statement into a problem statement. And then a nod to the literature or what others have said, experts recommend blah, 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 blah. And moreover, it is not clear whether teachers and learners have similar perceptions of the same feedback conversation and it's also not clear whether such approaches enhance seeking receptivity and in incorporation of feedback to the less well studied and the moreover, make it into a gap. Others have said this, but here is the gap. And then the hook is recently, and there's been an emphasis on relationships and application of coaching principles to feedback. And this warrants further exploration. So that is the hook. Therefore, the purpose of this study is in order to fill the gap and drawing people into the conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, who's gonna discuss strategies and tips for manuscript preparation from the next yeah. section. Thank you, thank you, Shuba. And so we've really spoken a bit here about the practical approach to the four sections of any manuscript that you're writing, the introduction, the methods, the results, and the discussion. <clears throat> those four areas together with tables and figures are gonna, are gonna kind of bring together a full manuscript. I think as Shuba was saying, <clears throat> you wanna come out of the introduction with everyone reading it and kind of saying, oh my goodness, I'm so happy this group is, is studying this problem. How could anyone not have done this before, right? Because you've identified this need, this area and the reason why that you think the study is being done. Before I move on to the methods, I, I think the one other irony to that is we're talking about that introduction and how it's written and how it's thought here and the last session of our seven seminar series. I would make an argument, you've probably gone through the same exercise during the first of the seven uh, programs, defining your research study, where you're looking in the literature as well, you're trying to define what it is and why you're studying something. So we've kind of come full circle, but the introduction is kind of putting that together in your manuscript, describing how you got into this and why you're doing it. Let's talk practically about the methods. Um, and so, you know, if I put on my reviewer hat and I invite others to do so also on this Zoom, uh, especially in the discussion, I would argue that the methods section is probably the one that gets scrutinized the most if you're a reviewer um, of a manuscript, if you're invited by a journal, because it really is gonna tell the story of whether the person is getting at how to study this correctly and therefore if the data are translatable, believable, reproducible, uh, and hence of value. So to me, I, I, I try and keep methods often, you know, fairly concise, not overly long, but I try and get ahead always of what a good reviewer will be looking for or asking for. So to lead on that, don't, you know, the, one of the bigger mistakes that we often see is that people begin to put data in methods. And if you're very strict um, in theory, that really all the data belong in the results uh, section. So in this case, um, it's not that we studied 122 uh, medical students. It's rather we, you know, prospectively collected data on medical students. Uh, and if you will, the 122 is a data point that belongs in the 
in the results. Uh, also, you're not gonna really put any analysis here, but the key to your methods is gonna be describing who you enrolled and then essentially how you pulled off your study. Details are really the critical piece. This is where people will be looking and trying to understand, is this a prospective uh, enrollment? Is this a retrospective? Are you studying a cohort? How biased could that cohort or that sample be? How representative is this population of what I am likely to see in the educational sphere around my environment? Uh, so descriptors like that, I think, become very, very important. Of course, this is where you'll put um, IRB approval as well, and you'll describe the statistical processes, especially as it relates to quantitative analysis. But if you're also going to do more of a qualitative analysis, then I think you have usually a little bit more depth to another paragraph or two to describe your process, to describe your theory, to describe your framework uh, that you kind of moved off on. I would argue that a good method section probably has more like you know, four to five paragraphs. I think eight might be a little bit on the long side, actually, even though I put it in the slide, um, but concise to the point. Um, and uh, you'll find that you're gonna wanna save some of those words and, and space for the discussion typically. Next slide, Shuba. All right, so the results. I mean, the, the results are kind of the fun part to write, right? Because you've been working for so many months on this project, sometimes a year or more. And finally, you can put this all down. and. The temptation at times uh, is to write everything, but again, the more concise you are, the better. So this is where you boil down a year or more's worth of effort into kind of just you know three to four to five paragraphs once again. But uh, from my perspective, the key is that you generally want to lead, of course, with your primary kind of endpoint. Why did you do it? What was the big thing you were studying? Uh, and you want to be able to kind of lead with that. So. Don't ever lead with a subset analysis, lead with your whole population. We studied 3,221 different uh, students from all medical schools in the United States. Uh, and uh, you know, here's uh, their kind of uh, demographic kind of distribution, and then here's what we found. Um, I like to think about a solid paper always having um, a kind of a couple different findings. And, and I try even when I, uh, in planning a manuscript to ask myself, have we kind of organized our paper into those three or more things? There's often one primary reason you're doing the study and that's what you're gonna show, but then there's maybe two sub-analyses. That would, that would be three different things you can show. One of the other issues I find quite commonly, so I, I put it out here as a distinct bullet, is be careful not to repeat uh, in writing in the prose section of your results uh, what you're going to put into a table or a figure for that matter. Um, a picture does sometimes speak a thousand words. And so um, we do often want to contain, we often want to make sure there are tables and figures. An easy way to start down that thought process is to realize that the classic table number one for any manuscript is gonna be descriptive about your study population. So it's going to be uh, how many uh, subjects were enrolled What's their gender distribution? Uh, if they're trainees, how many are interns, junior residents, or fellows? Uh, if they're different sites across the US, how many different sites, where were they located? But it's really more of a descriptive uh, type of table. Your, your tables and figures after that often are helping to expand a little bit on your findings. Uh, and so sometimes if you have a core finding that shows a difference, in how many perhaps learned that new mechanism or, or took that curriculum forward, you show it in a bar graph or a different way of, of kind of giving it emphasis. But again, try not to repeat the exact same data in the table that you're putting in the results. And I would argue over the course of time, you learn a few other tricks because people edit your papers over time. And you also, um, even if you get accepted, you'll get kind of editorial corrections at times from the journal themselves. And, Sometimes you'll find that um, it's easy to be duplicative. A classic example is we had 100 patients, uh, sorry, 100 subjects that we enrolled uh, and uh, 49 were female. Uh, the next sentence, someone will write 51 were male. Well, it's kind of already known, right? If, if, you, if there's a binary endpoint like male and female, that you don't have to necessarily write both of those. It's assumed that if 49 are female, that the, the difference will be the males. Um, so you can shorten the process through that. 
The results, I think, can be anywhere from three to eight paragraphs. It really depends on the depth of your findings. Uh, you just don't want to repeat, right? So if you have more of a qualitative endpoint, I think, to a study, I think you're going to show quite a bit more in the results because you're going to have to describe. This is where tables can also be quite expansive to show representative statements from what you've done on interviews. Uh, if you're quantitative, at times, this is a little bit on the shorter side. All right, with that, I'm going to pass it over um, uh, to, uh, actually, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll make a comment on the discussion and then pass it over to Ed. So the discussion, of course, is where you're kind of uh, putting it together, but hopefully by the time you're uh, talking about the discussion, writing the discussion, the reader already kind of knows what you want to say, what they've already kind of read the data and they've come to the same conclusion you have. Um, but in general, in the discussion, the trip up that often happens is that people begin by simply repeating the introduction. Uh, and you don't need that. You already set it up with an introduction. So your first paragraph of your discussion should be really your findings. What did we find? Uh, we studied X, we found Y, and this is novel because it's never been shown before. Um, you know, something like that is kind of the clear first paragraph summary that gets at the meat of putting together all that you've just shown through the intro methods and the, re and the results. I like in a discussion to get ahead of the problems. Every manuscript is imperfect, nothing's perfect. So I always spend at least a paragraph on uh, describing the limitations to any trial I'm a part of. Uh, and I often say, but here's why that was the case. We, you know, we acknowledge this is a small cohort, uh, but we still nonetheless think it's representative because of X, Y, and Z, something like that. Then, I do circle back a little bit in the discussion to acknowledge that we know the space, right? That, that you're doing research in. And so this is where sharing some comparative literature on the same topic might be interesting. We showed this, Jones and colleagues showed that, but there was a different cohort analysis, but we believe this adds to the literature on top of what they've shown. Uh, but it's really getting to the idea that you've shown something important and you've expanded on it. Um, and then usually a paragraph of summary at the end. So I think the discussion is probably the longer portion of the manuscript. I would argue a good six to 10 paragraphs at times, depending how long your paragraphs are. With that, I turn it over to Ed Krupat. Uh, yeah, so thank you, uh, Eric and Shuba. Uh, basically, what we've heard now is how to do it. And it's one thing to, it's one thing to, say, uh, I think I know how to do it, or I've heard it, and it's another thing to try to do it yourself. So what we're going to do uh, is to break you up into groups and to ask you in a very short time, usually, obviously, writing a paper takes more than 20 minutes. But God knows, I wish it only took 20 minutes, but it's going to take a lot more. But at least take a first shot. Uh, and here's what we're going to do. First of all, all of the groups are going to see an edited method section from a paper published that was actually published in Academic Medicine. It's provided to give you insight into why this study was conducted and how it was carried out. So you've got the methods, okay? Please read it as if you were one of the collaborating researchers who designed the study and you're going to be the person leading the team to write it up for publication. Once you've read the methods section, we're going to ask you and the members of the group to do the following, and that is each group will have a slightly different task, and we've talked about four sections. We're giving you the methods, so you might guess what the other three tasks might be to write the intro, or at least to plan and plot it, to write the methods or at least to plan and plot it and to write the discussion, even though you haven't seen, I'm sorry, to, in the second case, to write the results. Uh, and in the last case, to write the discussion or anticipate what the discussion would be like, even though you don't have results in front of you. Um, I, if I'm correct, uh, I, with my co uh, facilitators, if I'm correct, we're going to give each group about 20 minutes to do that and ask each group to assign a reporter to report out some of your findings, some of what you wrote, 
and also some of the issues that you encountered in doing this. Uh, let me just check with Shub and Eric that that's, ex that's the task that we wanted to give everybody. And with that, we'll break you up into groups. You will see your group, you will see the method section, which you'll have a little bit of time to read, and your group's task. Okay, I think we are now going to break into groups then. I think everyone's back. So I guess I can start. Um, ours was the intro section. So we read the methods and uh, we wrote a whole paper which we're going to submit tomorrow. No, never mind. Um, so we had a real nice back and forth and we went through the problem gap hook sort of heuristic, but then knowing that that's not the only model or that's not the be all and end all. However, uh, these are the bullets for the intro. So we wanted to frame what lack of duty are limitations, what were the adverse consequences of lack of duty are limitations, and then uh, describe the problem as fatigue and exhaustion leading to errors in patient care and dissatisfaction with teaching and learning experiences. So that was the framing of the problem. And um, in the next paragraph, we thought we'll talk about what people had studied thus far about or what data have already been collected about GTR reform and its impact on any teaching and learning. Um, but then uh, based on the method section, we thought the gap would be that we don't have enough data to uh, confirm that the GTR reform has met with the intended goals of the reform, of the um, en enactment the, of the implementation but we also did not have enough information and we're just assuming here whether there were any unintended adverse consequences to the GTR reform. And finally, we came down to the purpose of the study. There was one area that we didn't fill in, which was the actual hook, which would say without this study, I mean, the world will shatter tomorrow. There will be apocalypse. Uh, we didn't come up with that hook uh, in those 20 minutes but then we led to the purpose of this study was to examine the impact of the GTR reform and teaching and learning experiences uh, in, in internal medicine residency and clerkship and specifically the educational relationships between attendings, residents and students. So that was our intro bullets. Did you create a title? No, we didn't. <laughs> Apocalypse 2. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's go on to uh, Ed, your group, I think, results. I can uh, take us there. Hi, I'm Damien Shield from Emergency Medicine Simulation. Um, so we thought we would take the results to first report the demographic and general data uh, to describe some of the types of programs where people came from, understanding that Internal medicine is a is a uh, diverse group of programs. They might be uh, large or small. They might have um, be in community or academic type settings. They might be led by a new program director or a seasoned senior program director. Uh, they might take graduates from medical schools of different types in different countries, and so that could be described early on in in the table one. Uh, we wanted to then uh, get at the survey results and the Likert scales with the average and standard deviation most likely for each of the domains um, and uh, then do a, a subgroup analysis beyond that in any kind of meaningful categories. Maybe we thought um, that having a younger, newer program director might have led to maybe some newer, more radical changes or well, we didn't, we didn't know if it was going to be positive or negative on resident attending teaching opportunities, feedback, evaluation, patient care, um, sort of limited by not knowing what the data show. After that, um, we would also already be prepared with a pretty robust qualitative analysis uh, with multiple raters, probably in themes and all the modern methods of qualitative analysis to really take advantage of the opportunity to explain some of those trends based on the open-ended answers to the questions. 
Um, and I think we, you know, we would hope that in, in the, as a research group and when the introduction, we had proposed some kind of analytic framework for the learning environment or the impact of fatigue on learning or um, the challenge of balancing patient safety and education. So that we thought that any of that would offer us a lens for analysis and would present the data to tee up the discussion group. What did anybody from my group want to add to that? I think Christina had a good point that's being um, reflected in the title choice here, which is, do we want to lead as a mixed methods met, uh, study design? Because the type of question we're asking needs qualitative and quantitative analysis, or do we want to present it as a quantitative with an adjunct? Like it's supported, quantitative data supported by some narratives. And so that's a choice that the authors would have. We thought journal target would influence some of that. That's great. Thank you, Damien. I can report on group C. So we were tasked on taking the methods that we each read and writing our discussion uh, section. And uh, it's fantastic because we were able to write a discussion off of results that we made up. So it was, it was the best ever. So we led with, um, you know, we kind of broke down that first paragraph of the discussion. And uh, I'll give you kind of four sentences and why we led with those sentences. So the first sentence is without reproducing the whole introduction, we did feel just grammatically, sent, you know, paragraph structure, we needed a sentence that kind of set the stage. And so we made one up that essentially was the impact of GME based work hour reforms upon UME education is unknown, you know, has, is, is unclear. And so uh, that was kind of a framing kind of sentence. And it really spelled out that dichotomy here that this was a GME based intervention, right? Work hours. And yet it's a UME based clerkship data driven kind of um, uh, investigation. And so then the second sentence is kind of what we found. So our sentence was our data, uh, our data <clears throat> showed a significant improve, improvement in the extent and quality of medical education following work hour implementations. Um, we hope we're right on that, but at least that's what we, we made it up. Our sentence three actually, and four to that matter, we're putting front and center to the reader a little bit of trying to sell our study. Uh, our sentence three was about, you know, somehow bringing forth the idea that this was a mixed method studies. We, we have quantitative data on the Likert scale. We have qualitative data on the open-ended questions and they were uniformly consistent, but provide insight into, into these uh, interpretations. And then the fourth sentence was, hey, this was 112 schools across the US and there was an 84% rate. So our fourth sentence was, you know, these data representing a majority of US and Canadian schools uh, are likely to be translatable into any uh, medical education environment nationwide. Uh, and so if you will, we kind of led with the hook that we needed to address. We slammed it with the finding and then we sold it with the uh, extent of the research and the depth and breadth of how many um, how many people we studied. So, Ed, I hope we got this right because I think this is your paper. But it was outstanding when we wrote the discussion. It, it was not my paper, by the way. It was a paper that I found that I thought was interesting. I would wouldn't have minded having been been the author. Shiva, back to you. <clears throat> All right. So, um, you know, people have been suggesting titles and uh, Nadia, uh, you gave me a, a little bit of a brainwave. So that is a long sentence. And a lot of people like a crisp lead in and then a colon and then the rest of the study, which explains what type of study it is. So does duty or reform impact teaching and learning experiences of you can say students, residents, teachers, you can put the population there a mixed method study exploring opinions of whoever regarding outcome. So 
Uh, with that, I'm going to go back to sharing the screen um, because uh, we, uh, Ed is going to take us through to the end. Yeah. Here we go. So Shuba, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not gonna go through slides because it's oh. too, too little time to do that. So you can take, you, we don't have to share, but I just wanna give some kind of final thoughts that, that I had listening to what everybody's been saying. First of all, to remember, as Demian pointed out, that you have to decide where you want your paper to go. Um, it could go to a general interest journal, it could go to the annals, it could go to any number of excellent medical education journals. It could go to a disciplinary journal. So the Journal of Surgical Education, there's, there's in many, many fields, there are really good educational journals, or it could go a specialty journal. If you had done a paper on communications, you could send it to patient education and counseling that focuses on those kinds of papers. Also, you have to remember, you know, do you want to send it to an open access journal? Uh, lots of pros. The one big con, of course, is you've got to have some money because it's going to cost you anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars to have it published. But all of those are general kinds of issues which are secondary to, I think, what I'd like to do is reiterate the general message that, that we've heard in this session. And that is, what gets your paper published? Well, it's clear thinking and clear writing. Now, obviously, easier said than done. But I will give you my experience. I've probably reviewed hundreds upon hundreds of papers and found so many flaws that I'd like to say things to do and things to avoid. First of all, have a clear focus. Know what your paper's about. Um, and then take each of those sections, and we've taken them separately, but make them integrated. Put them together. Fill that gap. Get that hook. But that should lead to a clear and, total and easily described method section. Also, perhaps one broad piece of advice. When you've been working on a project for a year or a month or several years, it's almost impossible to imagine what a reader who's new to the paper needs to know and see and read. So make sure that your drafts are read not only by your co-authors, but by a couple of friends and colleagues who are outside who are willing to tell you, you understand this, but this is all neat, new to me. And it has to be described in more detail or more clearly. And then think of that paper as telling a story. The introduction gets us into what's happening. The methods into what you did. The results as to what you found. And then the discussion, as Eric pointed out, to... How do you make sense of it? What are the implications? Why do we know more? What new questions does this ask? That is, make this paper a complete whole that really makes a reader, a reviewer, an editor saying that there is really value added. I, knew some, I know something now that I didn't know before and or I'm even more curious now about some things that came out tentatively and can lead us to even further discovery. Uh, to me, that makes for not only good reading and good writing, but for uh, a science of medical education that, uh, that comes alive. So I will toss it back to Shuba or Eric uh, with the, to, to, Fill us in and complete the, the hour. Yeah, I, actually, Martin, I see Martin is here as well. And I wanted to give Martin the opportunity to add um, uh, his insights because he's uh, such a scholar as well. Um, thank you, Shubha. Um, you know, I, 
I'm struck by you know everything that um, that has been said to date is is exactly bang on, and um, but I think every paper takes a journey, and um, and so that uh, so sometimes the journey is clear cut and it's a straight path, and you know exactly which journal this is going to head to because it's a resident education thing, and JGME is the is the journal that you chose and right at the right at the outset. And, um, and a lot of us in biomedical sciences think that way, you know, that you're going to specify your null hypothesis, you're going to specify your alternative hypothesis, you're going to do a sample size, bam, 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 bam. And so everything's specified up front and the path is dug. But, the, um, but in, in educational research, we often go on journeys with our papers. And, um, and, and so that those journeys can go for a long time until the story emerges, even when you've collected the data in a prospective fashion. And, uh, and I, I'm always struck by how much I learn in the process of writing the paper and discover other people's literature and other people's um, uh, ways of doing it, even after you've collected yours. And so so, um, so I think that uh, that the writing process don't rush it. You know, it is the idea isn't necessarily to get it out the door. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful thing, and you should crack a, a nice bottle of wine when you do. But the um, but the journey itself makes you better, and um, and the writing process makes you better, and uh, and the fact that it's difficult is part of the thing. And if you're doing it right. It should be difficult, and um, in the sense that you're you're a researcher, you're supposed to be at the edge of your thing, and the edge is hard to write about. The edge is um, necessarily difficult and vague and complex and gray and all those sorts of things. And so that um, so that if you're you know in many respects, if it's too easy, it may be that you're not pushing yourself enough in terms of the process and in enough in terms of your own development. Development, if that's the if that's one of the ideas behind the paper. Actually, Ed uh, had some important things about you know when you've done the full submission and you get reviews back. Uh, Ed, do you want to add that piece as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, you should. Most journals will ask you for a point by point set of comments. Uh, so first of all, you don't have to agree with every single co reviewer's comment, uh, but either you, but you have to acknowledge them. And if you disagree, you have to justify why you think it should be kept as is. On the other hand, um, the one thing I, it's almost silly to say, but be respectful. Uh, even for reviewers who you didn't, who were, who gave you bad reviews or even unfair reviews, uh, but point by point, show how you are making changes. Um, I've just gotten two papers that for review of a revision, and it was so easy because they had told me everything that we had said as reviewers, how they addressed it, we saw it in the paper, and gee, there wasn't much debate after that. So look at those reviews. Th think about whether you agree, disagree. To the extent that you disagree, justify why not. To the extent you agree, uh, make those changes clear and obvious. And my guess is that once you send in that revision, you're going to get an acceptance back more often than not. I just want to thank everyone for uh, taking the journey this academic year with us, 2020 and 21. Um, as I mentioned, this is our seventh seminar series on this topic. Uh, and we've walked through, uh, if you remember, not everyone made every session. In fact, most of us probably didn't. Um, but we started with uh, formulating a research question as I mentioned, kind of almost coming full circle to how we think about writing the introduction here at the end. Uh, and then we talked about launching a, a study. We talked about with Sue and our reference um, team, how you can look at the literature and understand that most effectively. We talked about uh, very briefly quantitative, qualitative approaches. There's a lot more depth we could certainly go into on those and research um, processes. We talked about beginning to put the um, data together, surveys and other issues. We talked about how you begin to pitch your idea multiple different ways with Christina's talk. And then 
here we are writing the study. So I just bring all that together because if by chance you or a colleague missed any one of those sessions, you should come back next year and watch the ones you missed or just participate again. Uh, because I think by going through these repetitively, you, you do get new thoughts and new ideas and uh, reflect a little bit on the work that each of us have done um, for the benefit of moving us all forward. So thank you, Shuba, for putting this together um, and helping us lead this forward. And, uh, and with that, I want to thank everyone else also for being a part of this effort. Shuba, the last word goes to you. <clears throat> no, no. Uh, I just wanted to uh, sort of I congratulate our uh, Department of Medicine Prize scholars. Two of them are on, Anne and Zoe, uh, and for being with us on the journey. And then two of our new scholars are with us today, Irene from Palliative Care and uh, Shosh from Division of Aging. And we are going to have an exciting next year because we're going to also have uh, members, scholars from other departments. And I'm so, so thrilled to work with Eric and everyone in the BEI. Yeah, just fantastic. Thanks to Ed, thanks to Martin and for the team also behind the scenes who got, keep, keeps these running. And, uh, and with that, I uh, will wish everyone a great day ahead and uh, invite you back to our next BEI event. Thanks everyone. <laughs>